as far away as forever. This is where we meet to celebrate what never was as it comes to pass. Welcome friends. I'm your host Zen Garcia. This is Secrets of Build here on Truth Frequency Radio, and I appreciate all of you taking the time to join us this evening. I'm especially honored to have Michael A. Solomon as guest this evening. He, along with Chris Bailey, co-host Flat Out Insights and is also a photographer, um, illustrator, artist. Um, you do a number of different things and will also be speaking at the Flat Earth Conference in Dallas in November. Michael, are you there, brother? I am here. All right. And I appreciate your willingness to come on with us and uh, wanted to get you to speak about Canon Quest as well. But uh, if you would give out your contact and website, any information that you'd like to share with the listening audience. Sure. Uh, just to start off, um, also, I, I have my wife, who is also the producer of Canon Quest, along with oh, us. Oh, welcome. You know. Thank you. And what's your name, ma'am? Maria Solomon. Maria. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, welcome, Maria. It's an honor to have both of you here with me. Uh, so uh, everyone can reach us at uh, canonquest.com. Um, we also have a uh, Canon Quest um uh, Facebook page, and uh, our Canon Quest phone number is Maria. Do you know that number offhand? Um, well, you can reach us at CanonQuest.com and uh, our our Facebook page as well. Oh, right, oh, we have a Canon Quest YouTube channel also. Okay, wonderful. Uh, can you tell us uh, about Canon Quest? What is it that you do, and the kind of work and the information that you put out? Sure. Uh, Canon Quest is a, um, a line of trading cards, activity books, holsters, and now a game. And um, it's specifically designed to inspire people to, um, to have a curiosity and passion for scripture. Uh, we're not trying to teach a specific doctrine or anything like that. What, we, what we're doing is, hey, the word of the living God is awesome. Open it up and read it. And so that's what Canon Quest is designed to do. That is awesome. Can you um, be a little bit more descriptive as far as the, sure. the game, the trading cards, uh, how all that works and, you know, uh, where okay. people go? I mean, I'm assuming, are you selling it in other places like in Amazon or stores or anything of that nature not yet uh canon quest is still relatively new so we're looking for venues uh we're looking into that now um we're we're happy that it's being sold at sacred uh, word publishing uh, Excellent. yes uh, but uh we we've been selling it at conferences and displaying it at conferences presenting it to different church groups to get them um aware of the existence of uh, canon quest and um, really what, what it is, it's highly illustrated scriptural events. So we take uh, research. Maria is a phenomenal researcher. Uh, and we also have Nate Wolf, who backs up the research. So, oh. so, so we have a nice research team here. And then once they tabulate all the research, then, then I create the illustrations. Um, and I've been an illustrator for 35 years now. That's what I do for a living, you know, to pay bills and all that good Very stuff. Cool. Um, so we wanted to take those skills and put them into this project. So the art is specifically designed to compete against the secular media. In addition to inspiring people to want to uh, open the scripture and read it, um, it's also designed to compete with other uh, games like Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, um, those games uh, do not teach the values that we want our Christian children to be taught, but they look really good, all right? And so our job is to compete with those games. Um, and everything in Canon Quest is research-driven and original. So we create everything straight from scripture. 
Well, that's fantastic. As far as the game, is it similar to Magic the Gathering, or what are the dynamics? How does it? How does one play it? Ria, would you describe that? Sure. It's um, similar to games called like uh, the match game or concentration or memory or something like that that we all played when we were children. Uh, you take a card, turn it over, look at the card, and then find the match on the on the board. The uh. twist to it is, is that when you turn over that first card, you have to describe the scriptural event. Um, if you don't describe it, then you lose your turn. Um, Hardcore. Uh, and then <laughs> when you turn over the second, if you match it, then it's your turn and you get to go again. Continue, yeah. It gets, it gets sort of interesting when uh, you have a group of people playing and they sort of know the stories, but they don't really. So uh -huh. uh, it becomes a, a study tool because then you've got people telling the story all over, all over again. That's great. Uh, our, and so I'm assuming that um, you're going from Genesis through Revelation, or uh, how much are you covering with regard to the biblical narrative? We are eventually going to go from Genesis to Revelations, but what uh -huh. we decided to do was start with stories that people traditionally know. Yes, they're familiar with it. Right, and if they're familiar with it, then they can get into the stories. But the, the again, we have a twist in that as Nate and I do the study, we're actually reading what Scripture says instead of taking what the tradition says. Yes. Good so phrase. our cards look a little different than what the traditional storytelling is about. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's always something in the card that makes people say, hmm, Right. And then they, they have to go and study for themselves, which is what our purpose is. Uh, I'm assuming like subjects like biblical cosmology and also uh, the fallen angels, giants, those kind of esoteric concepts, which are not spoken about usually in the seminaries and Sunday school or by pastors that you are incorporating these kind of ideas into the, the game set. Is that correct? Yes, oh, we are. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's wonderful. <laughs> absolutely. Um, our first our first venture into that is David and Goliath. Um, nice. In series two, we do have the activity book that talks about that event. And it does not or I should say it has Goliath as a Nephilim. Uh -huh. so, awesome. Um, he has he's he's definitely a giant and definitely out of proportion and definitely as it it's described in the scripture. Now, what I did was, um, I mean, when you read the book of Enoch, it, it describes the Nephilim with, with great detail. Um, I made um, a Goliath to look the way scripture described him, because quite frankly, Goliath is kind of a short guy. Okay. He's a little Neph. You know, I mean, right, right. nine right. feet, nine inches tall, you know, uh -huh. so, so he's 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 a bit of a munchkin uh, when it comes to Nephilim. Uh, so so he has a humanoid look, but he's he's a rather ugly, dude, because Nephilim weren't known for 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 their high aesthetics. And uh, and I even gave him pointed ears um, just to show that he's not human. Uh -huh. uh, so um, also in David and Goliath, we made David a redhead. Because scripture is quite clear that David is a redhead. Uh -huh. okay? And so that's what we did. So usually, and, and we made him about 14 years old, which which in scripture, that's how old he was. Uh -huh. um, and so we try to stick with scripture. And when you do the research and create the art based solely off the research, it is an amazing experience. You should see Maria. She really geeks out because she has all the books all over the table, and she's and, and she really gets in the zone. Um, and then same same with with myself. I still have to do some research because I'm illustrating it, but the bulk of it is done by Maria and Nate. Uh, so illustrating straight from scripture is an amazing experience. Yeah. Um, well, you. I'm um, not completely sure if you're aware of the work that I do, but I study many of the extra biblical texts, 
mm-hmm. and a lot of those that are not um, well known uh, as far as you know mainstream churchianity. And certainly there are numerous texts which go into greater detail mm-hmm. on the ambiguity ambiguous story of Genesis 6 Mm -hmm. and that, uh, you know, bring different facets of information. Like, for instance, there's a book called um, And It Came to Pass, which is a a story book um, about David and Solomon. And in that particular text, it makes mention of the name of one of Goliath's brother, which is not included in the canonical material. There's um, you know, there's four brothers uh, of Goliath, and one of them remains unnamed. But in that particular text, it does reveal that the other one's name is Yishbi. And so, you know, those kind of details come to light when you study these uh, other extra biblical materials. And so, are is that something that you do as well? Do you do you incorporate or read or examine? Uh, any of these other uh, texts, or are you strictly um, sticking with uh, King James? Okay, this is a, this is a very good question. Um, we we call canon quests specifically for for that reason. Oh, um, the canonical, yes. Okay. Right. We we are not against the extra biblical texts, not at all, because uh-huh. they 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 um they confirm. What's what's in the canonical text, and it gives us extra detail, especially when you're il- illustrating. Yeah. Um, but what we wanted to do is focus the 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 uh, bulk of our work on canon, because those are the scripture that people know. Yes, right. Get yeah. them to open the Bible first, and then the yeah, Holy Spirit absolutely. will lead them everywhere right. else. But but no, I'm very familiar with 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 your work. And uh, and it's, it inspired me a lot to look into the other um, uh, to look into the other books. Oh, well, excellent! Well, and I think you're wise to do that, especially mm-hmm. since you're um, establishing and building a foundation. And you can always, you know, incorporate other sets which are focused on some of the other extra biblical materials, like maybe a a Jasher, you know, or Jubilees or, you know, to expand, expanded sets, you know, um, Mm -hmm. that focus on those kind of, those kind of books and the concepts that are found within them that, um, you know, the details varying, that that would also drive interest in people studying uh, those books. And it would also give you a whole nother product line, you know, um, and, you know, a whole nother uh, book to illustrate from, um, which would be interesting. That's definitely going to be down the line. Um, being commercial artists by trade, we what we do is we create a project, and the project has to support itself in mm-hmm. order to move on and to evolve. Yeah, sorry, I use that word. Evolve to other uh, uh, other manifestations of the project. So. Uh, that's definitely going to happen. Excellent. And so if people wanted to see some of your work as far as the illustrations and, uh, you know, portfolio, do you have something like that online available? Or, for instance, uh, different images of the cards uh, that make up some of the set um, that people can examine? Definitely. Uh, We have uh, uh, all Series 1 and 2, and we also have Canon Quest Extras, which are um, posters derived from the specific events that we depict. But oh, that, cool. uh, that can be um, uh, all viewed at CanonQuest.com. Um, and uh, so we call them wall art because they're, they're a bit more involved than your average poster. And the beautiful thing about illustrating all in 3D, um, because we we illustrate everything in 3D. The awesome. beautiful thing about that is once you create the 3D scene, then you can move the virtual camera around and get different points of view. And that's what Canon Quest Extras are. Um, we uh, get different points of view of of the uh, of of the specific event. Most excellent. Well. When we return, I want to um, 
get into kind of your testimony and leading up to uh, how you and what inspired you to create Canon Quest and also the other things that you are involved in, because I know that you're a great component of biblical cosmology and that you do mm -hmm. uh, photography and experiments to confirm uh, such ideology. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about your story together and how it is that you know you met and um, you know what compelled you uh, to come together as a couple and maybe the story a little bit of your faith? Sure. Wow. Uh, how long is this show? Um, but, yeah, we've got two hours. So we're <laughs> okay, almost okay. at first break. So, okay, you know, okay. we don't have to go into great detail, but I okay. thought that, you know, it would be interesting for those that don't know you and, uh, you know, to give you a chance to share your story. Sure. Um, Maria and I met uh, at a repast, of all things. Um, and um, I was supporting a friend of mine. Uh, her son was a uh, first soldier to die in the Gulf War, uh, a first Cleveland soldier to die in the Gulf War. Um, and I was supporting her in, in that. And um, I met Maria there. And it was just, I mean, it was, it was the Lord that brought us together. And three months later, um, we were married. And uh, awesome. it's, it's, it's been pretty awesome ever since. And, and Maria, we really match each other because of, of, of my skills and her skills, because we're very, um, we have a lot of history in, in what we do. And so it, it really works together. Because I look, I have no problem saying Maria is the business head of Aya Solomon. Okay. That's the name of our company, our parent company's name, uh, uh, Aya Solomon Productions. And Maria brings the business side to it. Thank God, because I'm the artist, okay? <laughs> um, I I do everything art, and, and that's all I do. That's all I've ever done uh, for the last 35 years. Um, but um, Maria does all the business stuff, and it's pretty awesome. Uh, that is a, a great blessing, because like yourself, I am um, creatively motivated and passionate uh, with that kind of inspiration. And when it comes to marketing and promoting uh, products and books and all that, not very good with all that, never wanted to really take the time to do all that. And I'm so grateful that my son and my daughter-in-law, uh, Joy, they are the ones that handle and do all of that. And praise God, it frees me up to really focus on what I'm deeply, deeply passionate about which is just, you know, being creative and reading the extra biblical text and also uh, putting together books. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's a great collaboration. Uh, and, you know, you got to have that. Uh, have the to. other side of it is very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, you, you definitely have to. Yeah. Well, Maria, can you tell us a little bit about your background and uh, how it is that, you know, you have the skill set to compliment uh, Michael uh, in you know your efforts and endeavors well I've been in business management for as long as he's been an artist for um, over f actually 40 years uh, working with small business administration and several government agencies as a procurement agent and a contracting officer so I've been on the business side of things of a lot of different industries for a while and when Michael and I got married we were doing two separate businesses, and at one point we thought, hmm, why aren't we working together? Because it just would make more sense uh -huh. for, for me to support him and what he's doing and make it, make it grow. So we decided uh, about eight years ago to start working together, and um, I let the rest of my clients go, and so we've been working on it ever since. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, with regard to kind of the journey to awakening, can you speak about that a little bit uh, for both of you and, um, you know, how you came to know about, um, uh, um, you know, the, like things like the New World Order or 9-11 or biblical cosmology, anything uh, specific, you know, even with the Nephilim uh, giants and fallen angels and, you know, that kind of aspect of the, uh, the Bible. Okay. Um, I was brought up traditionally. 
um, your, your, your standard um, church slash heliocentric education. And uh, um, I was brought up, you know, believing in space and believing man landed on the moon and, and all that stuff. Um, but as I got older, I started to realize that, that a lot of that stuff was not true. Um, and, and so as time went on, it really prepared me for, for the big moment. Uh, once, once I realized, uh, uh, the earth was flat and that space does not exist, which was a terrible moment for me, really. I mean, because <laughs> I told Mark Sargent, he ruined my life. I mean, he's gotten that from, from, from so many people right. because I was the original space cadet. I loved space. I didn't just realize space existed and just accepted it from school. I loved space. Okay. Right. Once I realized something that huge was a complete and absolute lie, that it was actually created by Satan and not God at all. Yeah. Um, I was physically sick for three days. Um, <laughs> I mean, literally physically sick for three days. But I, I was prepared by, by Yahweh through learning that vaccines are a joke and that 9-11 was an inside job and Sandy Hook was definitely fake and, and uh -huh. all of this. And from researching all of that, um, I was prepared. So once I heard Mark Sargent, then I researched it in the Bible. I know it should have been the other way around, uh -huh. but, but <laughs> what are you going to do? So right. once, once I realized that, I believed it immediately. Um, uh -huh. as, as soon as I heard it and then the Holy Spirit said, use your professional eye. So I started looking at the world with my professional eye and it just didn't connect. I mean, as a photographer, one has to know how to use perspective. You have to know how to use light. You know, a lot of people think, well, you aren't a scientist. You, you can't even contradict them. I use as a imaging professional, I use light composition perspective I and, 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 and many other um, aspects of the creative world I use that on a on a on a uh, consistent basis day by day I have right. to learn to manipulate it and get predictable results so once I learn once I learned to see the world through those eyes that was it it was over at that point I mean it's like what you know um, none of it made any sense at all. Yeah, well, you, with the work that you do, you have a keener eye for detail. And because of that, you know, you should be able to discern greater than, you know, a lot of people that are just walking around uh, and like zombies. Uh, you know, we yeah. have half the world now stuck in their phone. They can't even look up from mm -hmm. monitoring Facebook or whatever. I mean, it's it's so crazy how people are attached to that technology now and don't even you know realize what's going on in the world around them um, but can you tell us a, a little bit about when it was that you woke up for instance to to 9-11 and to vaccines and uh, to this kind of information and how it was that you and Maria um, came to the truth together i mean do you speak about and share in discussions the different things that you are researching um you know can you share a little bit about that as well um as as far as the other um hoaxes and and, and lies really that are being told um as as i got older i realized that those things were fake here's here's the interesting part when i was a kid I would look up at the sky because I was always looking up. I would look uh -huh. up at the, at, at the sky and I distinctly remember saying to myself, wow, that looks like a dome. Nah, and it couldn't be a dome because my teacher said that's just the atmosphere and you float uh -huh. up in there and you go into space and you just pop out into a void. Um, and so I started to just believe what I was taught, but I distinctly remember saying it looked like a dome. As far as 9-11 and stuff like that um sure when it first happened i got angry too i said oh yeah. those, those arabs look what they did right. okay um but then i started hearing these wacky youtubers <laughs> who were saying 9-11 is fake i said nah and then i started 
listening to them. I said, wait a minute. You're right. I mean, a buildings just don't fall like that. Right. What about building seven? That doesn't make any sense at all. Yes, and right. so and so I began to believe it rather quickly because it made sense. If it makes sense, I'm good with it. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, and so and so I was really set up for the flat earth quite easily after that. Um, because I I don't believe in in a lot of the stuff, good grief, most of it that I was taught when I was a child. Um, right. You know, oddly oh, enough... On, Michael. Oh, on. sure. Yeah, we're at the first break. We'll be right okay. back, everyone. Thou hast fixed the earth immovable and firm. Psalms 93.1. Okay, let me turn this back over to you, Michael. You were talking about just your journey to awakening and how you became aware of, well, not only 9-11, especially, you know, that buildings don't go down because of fire. And certainly the official story they told us that, you know, World Trade Centers one and two, uh, that they went down because of these jet airliners hitting them, the jet fuel burning, the steel melting, and them pancaking. But yet we have World Trade Center seven, which was not hit by any jet airliner. And yet this 47 story building also collapses uh, upon itself uh, within 11 seconds. And so uh, please continue. Um, you know, I, I actually uh, looked it up and there was, uh, it reminded me of a story uh, in the 30s, I believe, um, a rather large plane smashed into the Empire State Building. Right. Uh -huh. um, and, and, and there's plenty of pictures on, online where you can see this. And all it did was pop the hole in it. Um, right. The people on the plane died, but the uh, they popped the hole in the um, uh, Empire State Building, and they cleaned it up, and they fixed the hole, and it was good as new. Okay? Now, this plane was flying at full speed, and they, they lost their way because of the fog, because they didn't have the uh, FCC, um, I mean, you know, they didn't have the regulations that they have now, right. all the safety measures they have now. So it smashed into their full speed and it popped a hole in the building. Why? Because the building was specifically designed to withstand plane crashes because of its height. OK, the um, twin towers were the same way, only better. All right. right. They were designed to withstand acts of God and a plane crash. OK, so so those uh, jetliners should have basically done the same thing, broke some glass, popped a hole in the building, maybe actually, um, and basically bounced off and fell down right. to the ground. That's what should have happened. Um, but what you saw there makes no sense whatsoever. And when you zoom in on it and do just a little poor man forensics, I'm not talking really hardcore uh, CSI stuff. I'm talking just poor man forensics. And if you just zoom in on it, you notice those planes do some really weird things. And when you work in the 3D world, you tend to see uh, anomalies that you would see with a poorly done 3D animation, uh -huh. okay? When your collision detection is off, okay? And, and, and the plane didn't crumple right, I mean, it, it should have just collapsed if it was going to hit as hard as they say. It should have just collapsed right. upon itself. Yet it didn't do that. It seemed to melt into the building. Right. I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I was just going to say, especially considering that the World Trade Centers were built with an outer steel um, reinforced, you know, uh, right. that the walls were. And there's no way that... Uh, a plastic coned aluminum airliner could have <laughs> penetrated that steel mesh. Right. Um, and as you said, it would have just just collapsed on the outer wall and fell to the ground. Now, I can see if a, if a flying fortress, you know, like in World War II, the, uh -huh. uh, uh, the um, B-series bombers, uh, I can see if one of those things smashed into it full speed. Yeah, you're going to get definitely some more damage out of it. 
this tower is still not going to fall and it will still make right. a bigger hole and make a bigger mess, but yeah. it will still not, it just will fall. What happened to those towers were virtually impossible. It Absolutely. couldn't have happened. Now I understand people believe it did because we aren't scientists in quotes and we don't know what we're talking about, yada, yada, blah, blah. I understand that. But the fact remains that the, the architecture of that building um, should have withstood such a um, lightweight aircraft. Yes. Okay. Um, there's no way it could have doom, 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 fall down in steps like that. Right. Pancake, That's yeah. virtually impossible. The only way that happens is when you do it on purpose. Absolutely. All right. Because even if a building is blown down by explosives, it splatters everywhere. It explodes everywhere. Okay, it doesn't just dum, 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 fall down like that. Right. That was controlled demolition. Absolutely. It's obvious. That's just the way it is. And and so once I realized that, it was downhill from there. Yes, yes, and it was the same for me because um, you know you can't have a, a 110 story building collapse in upon itself, especially no. according to the official story of melting steel and pancaking in 11 seconds i mean it's just not possible and then for, to have three buildings go down on that day um is again uh, virtually impossible and the official story you know as far as they're saying that a jetliner hit the pentagon when yet there's no debris field uh no engine parts no uh <laughs> wings i mean nothing and yet they said that they um identified the dna of every passenger on that plane is just utterly ridiculous and so um even the you know the story that they tried to get us to buy into was so utterly ridiculous and so bogus it was easy to see through uh if you really examined with an open mind uh the official story it was easy to debunk all that the government has said and certainly something was not right about what we were being told. And so I know that that event was a catalyst for many people to awaken to mm -hmm. the possibility that, yeah, government's lying to us, the media is lying to us. Uh, there's something more to uh, what we are being told and that we need to not just trust or believe what they say, but to actually examine the narrative and um, really confirm uh you know truth in in the manner that they are trying to present it and the way that it really is what what we say on flat out insights is don't accept verify right okay? don't just accept it um i teach photography um every now and then and one of my students we we started talking about science um and one of my students I think his parents were really into science. Uh, actually, I think they were scientists. And I told him, I said, well, my, my thing is this. Don't simply accept everything you hear. Verify everything. The little boy who was 11 years old cussed me out, literally, in class. <laughs> I did not tell him the Earth was flat. I didn't tell him space didn't exist. All I said was, don't accept everything you hear. Yes, right. Verify. Use the common sense that the Lord gave you. Um, he not only cussed me out, he never came back to class again. Oh, goodness. Now, that's severe preconditioning. Uh -huh, right. Okay. I didn't even say anything dramatic, yeah. you yeah. know. That's severe. I mean, he was yeah. taught, to don't even look into it. Right. Okay. Right. And so that's what we're dealing with. Those who know the truth have the burden of speaking the truth and trying to bring as many people as they can over to the truth. Right, right. Uh, you know, the cognitive dissonance is so supreme uh, among people's lives. I, I find in even you know bringing forth the possibility of the things that we talk about, that it is difficult for individuals to overcome their indoctrination. That is the first and foremost. And that obstacle largely s remains in place for mo pe mo most people. They're not able to overcome it and to get past it to actually 
investigate something with open mind and open themselves to new possibility. And so, you know, the iron bars of the prison is within the minds of so many, as, you know, the Matrix movies, <laughs> the depiction of all that. I mean, really, that's that's how it is. And so in you and Maria understanding and knowing the truth, uh, are you able to, have you been able to share these kind of things with your loved ones, with uh, people closest around you, family, friends, uh, or is this something that you have to mainly share with your listening audience? And if you would also talk about your flat out insights where you are doing shows with uh, Chris Bailey, who I've got a uh, great respect for. It. Okay. Um, let me, let me just say this one thing. I was taught heliocentrism in the public school system. Yes. Maria went to a private school. She was literally taught that, uh, the world was geocentric. Really? Wow. That's amazing. And I didn't know that until I brought this to her. Cause I thought she was going to think I was wackadoo. <laughs> and, and, and I said, the earth doesn't move. And she said, well, no, of course not. <laughs> and I said, and the moon is on is is its own light source. She said, well, yeah. I said, well, what are you talking about? I, you knew this already? I said, yeah. I thought everyone knew. No, no, everyone does not know this, you know. Right. So Chris and Liz were also taught in school, yes. and she actually showed me her workbook where they were taught that the Earth was geocentric. Yeah, that's right. pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. So not all of us were completely lied, lied to. Yeah, and, right. and, I, and I didn't know it was a conversation. When he brought uh -huh. it up, I was like, well, yeah, what's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's not something that people talk about often. No. Uh -huh. um, but just most recently, when you talk about sharing with our loved ones, um, I was, um, at the church we go to, they definitely are not, they don't believe in the flat earth. Um, mm -hmm. But there are some people who um, I talk to often. And I was in a study group and the pastor was talking about uh, Genesis. And as he was talking, of course, he talks about the globe and, the, and how the earth, earth moved and all of that. And I was sitting there, <laughs> I'm like, okay, how do I bring this up in this room? And I looked around the room and I said, well, I don't. Um, it was, would have totally gone another way. And I, it, sometimes when you're disturbing people's peace, it's just not a good thing like that. Right. right. Uh, one, of, one of the people came up to me and said, wasn't this an awesome class? And I said, mm -hmm. no, it wasn't. She's like, well, what was wrong? I was like, well, do you really want my opinion? And she's like, yeah. I said, He's talking about the earth all wrong. The earth is flat. It doesn't move. She's like, what? <laughs> and I don't even know why I said it to her. It just came out. But <laughs> I said, it doesn't move. Do you want all the scriptures that talked about the earth doesn't move? She's like, well, well, the earth does move. And then she started describing the universe and how it moves. You know, everything moves around the sun. And then the sun moves around in all these different planets and all of this stuff. I said, wait, 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 wait. Just go read the Bible and let's talk about it later. Uh -huh. She went home and she called me the next day and she wanted to know the scriptures that I was talking about so she could call the pastor and have a discussion with him. And she wanted me to call him and get my answer straight because she wanted <laughs> me to make sure that I was okay with what he was talking about. And I said, I don't need to talk to him. He obviously doesn't understand. So why would I call him and ask him what I already know? Right. Um, so she did call him and they had a two hour conversation. So they sent me an email to say, here's the scriptures, here how, here's how you should read them. And my only comment back to her was, please read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, please. So like those kinds of conversations are, you know, the people who are around us, that's, that's where they are. That's mm -hmm. just an example. So, right. but we'll continue to talk and we'll continue to bring it up and hopefully someone will pick up to read it for themselves. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, that that's a, a beautiful thing that you were actually taught the truth about. Uh, can, can you tell us what school that was? And you Yeah, know. 
Um, I, I did go to a Catholic school um, in Detroit, Michigan. The school doesn't doesn't exist anymore. It was called St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and like I said, I didn't know that everybody wasn't taught that way. But. Right. And it was an issue. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead, ma'am. I was going to say, the fact that it took him, what, three three weeks to tell me? Yeah, right. <laughs> I thought she's gonna. Th- I, I I thought she's gonna. You know, look at me like I was a nutcase. And right. It's like, Which huh? is usually the case. Right. Oh, yeah. I've heard of marriages dying. Right. Yeah. Now that's a bit extreme. I mean, come right. on. Okay. I mean, everybody out there, do not divorce your spouse because they know the earth is flat. That's just silly. Yeah, okay. I fully agree. Yes. Wow. But you know, the the contention gets to such a a degree that uh, for whatever reason, people allow it, you know, even amongst the Christian body, that people are allowing this non-salvational issue to divide them in such a way that uh, they can't even speak to each other or they get so (laughs) upset that, you know, they want to condemn and judge and criticize and, um, and, and throw stones at one another. It's just, like you said, it's it's absolutely uh, ridiculous in in my opinion. But my, my my the part that kills me the most is the few times I do talk about this to uh, church folk, they say, "Well, well, it's not a salvational issue." I say, "Okay, wait a minute. Did we just change subjects?" Okay, because we were discussing cosmology. I I I didn't say anything about salvation. They always uh-huh. push it back to salvation. Right. This is a relational issue. But I will say this to some people, it is a salvation issue. Absolutely. I because, totally agree. Because the the uh enclosed cosmology truth of scripture can be a catalyst to salvation. Right. I have personally witnessed card carrying, God hating, Christian arguing atheists fall on their knees once they realize yeah. Genesis one is literally real. Yeah. Okay. So to them, it's a salvation issue. Absolutely. Yeah, I I do absolutely agree with you. And especially when you consider as well that there are a huge number of generation Xers, the, you know, Mm -hmm. this generation that have been divided from relationship with the Most High God Mm -hmm. because of the the teaching, the educational system and the indoctrination into that, you know, we evolved of monkeys and that uh, mm-hmm. The evolutionary Copernican heliocentric model for understanding world that that absolutely has divided them and has separated more people from understanding that the scriptures being prophetic are without a doubt um, inspired by divinity, you know, by the mind of God. And so not having doubt on uh you know, the biblical cosmology or, or doubting that God even exists as science tries to so <laughs> boldly proclaim right. uh, that life just evolved uh, of random accident and that because of the earth being in the so-called Goldilocks zone uh, and that there's all these other worlds out there and that every star is a sun uh, possibly surrounded by planetary system and any one of them could evolve life in the manner that you know all of that creates doubt in individuals minds as to whether there truly is a creator because science declares that there's no need for there to be a creator as long as you have these circumstances and so that has certainly uh removed so many uh from having security uh, in in their eternity through God and especially through Christ uh, as Savior Messiah. And so, yeah, for, I would say, a lot of the world, this most certainly is a salvational issue. Maybe not for Christians, you know, of course, right. um, sure. uh, that you know have already uh, a belief and a faith in Christ as Savior Messiah, but uh, for those that don't and have been separated because of scientism from belief in divinity or even entertaining uh, the possibility that, you know, this is not an accident and that everything was created 
specific, uh, even uh, we being made in the image of the Most High, and that the earth and even the cosmos, the, everything was created for us uh, as a place of habitation, and yeah. everything is special and significant. The part that, that kills me the most is also the infiltration, the successful infiltration, the world scientific community has made in the church. Yes. Because, and, and I mean in small and little ways, yes, most churches deny evolution, although there are some that actually uh, profess it, which is kind of right. weird. Um, right. <laughs> but, but most deny evolution, most deny um, um, their creation narrative of the Big Bang. But you get the little things, like um, uh, churches uh, tend to believe that, that the further back you go, man uh, was less intelligent, and the further right. up time goes, man <laughs> becomes smarter. When if you read scripture, it's literally the other way around. Opposite, it's completely yes. opposite. Exactly, yeah. Man was a lot smarter, especially pre-flood. Right. Okay? Man was a lot smarter um, than, than they are now, and they became dumber as time right. went on. Right. Okay. And, and history kind of proves that without, with, with no problem, but the church believes this and it has led to a, a lot of silly little church traditions that have led people to see the holy word of, of almighty God as this old book that has no relevance whatsoever. Because right. it doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, the Ark, okay, uh, Noah's Ark, when you look at Noah's Ark, you have to realize that Noah was a genius, okay? Yes, he was given the instructions by Yahweh. Yes, absolutely. But what about all the other stuff, okay? What, I mean, I'm sure one 18 inch window had nothing to do with ventilation. Right. All right. Where did the light come from and all the other things that they had to deal with um, as they were on the ark getting ready to land? So he had to have technology. Oh, yeah. Let's not forget. They built a 450 foot by 150 foot by 75 foot boat with four dudes. <laughs> right. OK. And 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 the and the movie Noah's Ark with uh, uh, Russell Crowe. No, the Nephilim did not help them. OK, right. that was horrible. Um, I want to talk about movies. Yeah, eventually. that was one day, movie. not this show, but one day. Yes, but, um, yes. but how did four guys build this giant boat all by themselves? Uh -huh. All right. Um, they had some sort of technology somewhere, somehow to do that. OK, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, yeah, that that was no small feat. I mean, no. to create and to have all the animals come. And uh, there are stories where, you know, the animals were instructed and um, led to Noah, but still no small feat to be able to uh, subsist and to sustain themselves and to keep, mm -hmm. um, you know, everything docile and calm. And uh, yeah, I mean, to, to make it through what is the greatest catastrophe um, that one could ever uh, be exposed to or overcome. I mean, oh, wow, that was just, can't even imagine, you know, having... I mean, it, uh, was, it, was, it. it was explosive, literally explosive. Uh -huh, right. because, because you're taught in the churches that it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Mm -hmm. Well, if you read the narrative, it never said it rained. Mm -hmm. It said that the gates the windows, of heaven, yeah, the, right. the windows opened up. In, in some right. translation, it says gates, and the water from uh, from beneath uh, burst through. Right, now, yeah, let's think perfect. about that. We're talking massive pressure. Right. All right? right. So you have all this water coming down from the dome. So literal doors opened up. Now that we know there's a dome up there, and right. what the Bible says is actually true, these doors, literal doors opened up. And this water came flooding down simultaneously as these uh, massive fountains of, of, of water burst up when all that pressure was released. That was probably akin to a nuclear bomb, though I don't believe uh -huh. in nuclear bombs. Uh -huh. uh, that's another thing that I, I don't believe that at all. Uh -huh. but, but it had to have that level of explosive power. So when people say, well, if they were so advanced back then, pre-Noah, how come we don't 
see any proof of that, read the narrative. There was right. a lot of destruction going on there. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so what what could have survived that? Right. And another thing that people forget is that the scriptures declare that, you know, the uh, the biblical patriarchs, they lived almost a thousand years, yep. you know, the first 10 generations. Yep. And having yep. longer lifespans, and uh, I believe they were also larger in stature, that living that long, just think of the knowledge that they had accumulated and the yep. things yep. they knew. So yep. without a doubt, they were very much wiser uh, than we could ever even imagine. I mean, and like you said, um, in my opinion, we have devolved oh, since yeah. that time. Oh, yeah. Uh, and also, we're in, in. Actually, you 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 just said something that I tell people all the time. Noah was ten generations from the smartest human to ever live. Okay, only ten generations. That made Noah a genius. All right, and the smartest human to ever live was 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 Adam. So, hold on, brother. Okay, sure. All right, we'll be right back, everyone, for second hour. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Sen Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio, and I am honored to have as guests with me this evening both Maria and Michael Solomon of Canon Quest, and also Michael is the co-host of Flat Out Insights. Uh, Michael, how long have you and Chris been doing shows? Um, uh, It's been a couple years now, and um, where can people go to find and listen to your program and and when do you actually broadcast live um we have uh yeah we've been at it for about two years and uh we have a flat out insights uh youtube channel and that's uh where we uh do our shows we're also on take on the world tv um and yeah and that's on uh youtube as well but there's also a facebook page um, what, there is also a Flat Out Insights uh, Facebook page as well, but that's where we just post um, information about how to do experiments and current events in, in the cos- cosmology issue. Uh, that's most excellent. Can you talk about some of the shows, some of the broadcasts that you've had and uh, maybe the, the guests that you've invited? Um, we've... Uh, explored a lot of uh, uh, concepts as far as how to prove that the world, the reality of the world. So uh-huh. we, we've worked on um, historical content. Um, we did one show that was really cool where, where we talked about the Cleveland connection of uh, how different scientists right here in Cleveland, Ohio, where, where we're based in, uh, where they did experiments that actually proved that the Earth did not move, and they actually did those experiments at Case Western University. Uh, so, so that was Excellent. pretty cool. Um, and Chris is really good at digging up that kind of research. Uh, and so, um, and so we've we've really focused on a lot of uh, information on how to prove that the Earth uh, is not what science says it is. Uh-huh. Um, so, um, we've taken a little hiatus away from the show, uh, due to take on the world, uh, conference yeah. uh-huh. and, uh, cause that's, that was some, that was some serious busy work there. So, right. um, we're about to pick it back up again because we not only do flat out insights, but we do, uh, flat earth meetups as well, um, here that's in great. the, uh, uh, Ohio area. So, so we're about to pick all that back up again. Uh, so you and Chris, y'all live close together. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. We're, oh, that's we're, wonderful. Yeah, we're about a half hour away from each other. Oh, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that was pretty cool because once I learned about this, uh, the whole Flat Earth Truth four years ago, so basically when it started, yeah. and I wanted to um, go to some of the conferences, but they were too far away. I couldn't afford it, and I was real yeah. bummed. And I had never been to a conference before in my whole life. Uh-huh. Heck, I had never been to a concert. Um, so, <laughs> so this was a whole new thing for me. And then um, uh, Mark Sargent, once again, 
Um, he, uh, I listened to his show a lot, and he said that, uh, hey, there's this great um, uh, 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 conference going on called Take On the World. Maria, what was the first conference? I keep forgetting. Um, just right outside of Cleveland. Yeah, it, it was uh, right outside of Cleveland. And I was like, what? Oh, man, this is great. So I told Maria, and then I, I got the number from uh, Mark and called Chris, and we was on, we, we were on the phone for two hours. Um, oh. And so I was just an attendee uh, the first year, and then I became a speaker the next year. Nice. Um, and so you spoke this year at the conference? Yes, I did, and I love it. Um, I, I thought that my speaking days were over because, you know, I, I have a history in public speaking, acting, um, and just performing, um, in, in various ways in front of, um, audiences. So, um, but I kind of switched over to the 3d animation and stuff like that. And I was in the studio most of the time. So, and I have a science background. I was a, a, a chemistry major when I first started college, um, and so, but I thought that part of my life was over until this whole movement um, spinned off. And I started speaking because once I learned that I could actually help the movement with the skills that I was blessed with um, and the experience that I've had in, in the field of art, um, especially photography and videography uh, and the 3D animation part of it, then I started doing speaking engagements on it. And now it's, I, I speak a lot and I love it. Um, I spoke um, at, at Take On The World 2019 and it was probably the, the best, um, the, the best speaking engagement I've ever had. Can you tell us um, about the topic that you covered and what you spoke upon? Sure. I spoke on how to verify the true cosmology for yourself. Um, oh, interesting. And how everyone can do it, okay? You don't need uh -huh. a massive degree. Yes, right. I've, I've been doing what I do for 35 years. I have a degree in it and that sort of thing, but you don't need it. And I'm not trying to minimize people who have degrees. I'm not trying to say it's a waste of time and all. No, not at all. What I'm saying is this world was created to reflect the nature and the power of the living God. Everyone can see that, okay? We have to be taught how to see it because we were taught how not to see it. Right. So, so my goal on, on this conference was to show people just common everyday ways to um, actually see the world for what it is. One of my favorite proofs is crepuscular rays. Um, light, light rays that you see coming through the clouds. Science says that that's due to perspective. When I first learned that, I laughed out loud. Mm -hmm. I said, wow, science just did all my work for me. Thank you, science. Um, I mean, because they said that perspective is why you see those rays coming from, from, from the sky at an angle through the clouds. Mm -hmm. That's not true at all. That's not how perspective works ever okay right. and so what i did was i did a live experiment and i created corpuscular rays right there in the conference and i had a, an extensive powerpoint with a bunch of animation and video much of it taken myself to to show that corpuscular rays have nothing to do res, with perspective at all okay right. once you realize that then it opens you up to a lot of possibilities of truth. Yeah, okay. uh, for the listening audience that may not know what corpuscular rays are, and also the perspective that you're describing of the okay. sunlight coming through the clouds at angle, um, you know, if we're 93 million miles away and the sun's 108 times bigger than the Earth, we should have parallel rays, and that's not right. what we see. And so if you would... Uh, explain further for those that may not know. Sure. Um, first of all, corpuscular rays are the light beams, uh, the rays of light that you see coming through the clouds uh, that are so awe-inspiring. Um, during and, sunset. Right, right. During during sunset 
or or not not even that. Uh, like after a good hard rain, yeah, so the clouds right. start to break up, and you'll see these these light rays coming down. A lot of people call them God rays. Okay, and and what science says is what you're seeing is the same thing you see when you um, actually look down a railroad track and you see a railroad tracks they converge as they get further away from you when your eye is right in line with the uh, railroad tracks um that is perspective absolutely okay but when you're looking but if that were true if perspective is is the reason why you see the rays coming down uh at an angle you would literally have to be directly under the rays in order to see that perspective and yet Who's ever directly under sunbeams when they're coming down from from the clouds? Uh -huh. So, what 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 sunbeams uh, actually prove is proximity, because the only right. way you can create sunbeams is you need three things: you need proximity, particulates, and obstruction. Okay, so. So in this case, we're talking about the sun, all right? Because you can use it, you can do it with the moon or street light, okay? But the sun has to be close to the obstruction, which are the clouds, and then the rays come through and illuminate particulates, which is usually dust, uh, fog, uh, smoke, um, uh, 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 and, and different types of, of um, of things that are floating around in the air, pollution. Um, but the, the main thing is you have to have a close light source. And Zen, I mean really, really right. close. Okay? Right. In order for the sun to, to make those rays spread out like that, it has to be really close to clouds. And clouds are five to seven miles high. Let's be um aggressive here and give it 20 miles okay um the highest clouds and the sun has to be right on those clouds in order to make those rays do that right. okay so sunbeams prove a close light source it cannot be 93 million miles away it is not possible oh and by the way everyone can you see 93 million miles no, no i mean no come way. on we wouldn't even see the sun Right, we wouldn't even sure see it. Like, I don't care how big it is. Right. You cannot see 93 million miles away. Exactly. And, and when I was doing the um, presentation, I actually shot a video of myself on my street. And I and, and I did what's, 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 what's called a license, what I call a license test. I said, I can't see it. I can't read a license place two houses down from me. So how can uh -huh. I see 93 million miles away? Right. So I actually walked away from, from the camera one house, walked away two houses, walked away three houses, and the audience died laughing because they said, oh, <laughs> shoot, I can't read that license plate. I said, well, how are you going to see 93 million miles away? Right, right, okay. exactly. Yeah, it's impossible. It's absolutely ludicrous. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rob, Rob Skiba and I were doing a show not long ago where we were talking about how uh, NASA supposedly took a photograph of a uh, black hole, which is uh, six, <laughs> tr six million light years away or something right. ludicrous like that. Right. And, you know, I mean, just the what they have us buying into and believing is so utterly ridiculous. It's it's laughable, really is okay, laughable. Okay, now here's, now, now here's a part that that I want people to understand. The human eye, and it doesn't matter what augmentation you have, meaning it doesn't matter what lenses you have to help you see. You cannot, the eye, the human eye cannot resolve an image past the convergence points of perspective. Uh -huh. So what does that mean? It 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 means that once, once perspective converges to that single point, you can't see beyond that point. Right. So when you're looking at the railroad tracks, when you see those railroad tracks meet, you don't know, you can't see beyond that point. Even if you look, use the P900 or, or the P1000 with their 2000 and 3000 lens, you can see further, but that, that convergence point is going to happen. Okay? Uh -huh, right. And you can't see beyond that point. So, so when NASA says they can see trillions, 
they can see so far away that they can literally see back in time. I mean, come on, really, come on. Okay, right. let's just be so. So when they say that, that's a lie because you cannot see past that convergence point. You can't see past single point perspective. It is not possible. Right. And it doesn't matter how powerful your lens are because at some point, you can't see it. Yes, exactly. And, you know, again, that's why uh, with regard to the sun, uh, sunsets and sunrise, it's not that the sun is disappearing below the, the horizon, mm -hmm. but it's just reaching the point of vanishing right. to where we can no longer see it. And it leaves our field of uh, perspective. Yep. And even with, you know, uh, you, you had mentioned rail rate, railroad tracks, same kind of thing. It disappears. Everything converges to the vanishing point on the horizon yep. and then disappears. Yep. And and so, um, Maria, I wanted to give you a chance. Did you uh, care to comment here on anything or or share a story or anything? Just uh, didn't you want you about, to feel left out. Oh, I'm good. But. When you okay. saw Cleveland, um, that that was your, your, your tipping point when you saw Cleveland Oh, when 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 it seemed so so evident for me um, that the Earth was flat was it was a really clear day and you know it's only eight miles before you before the Earth is supposed to start its um, right curvature going around the curve uh -huh. and I was standing at by our house <laughs> and we we're about thirteen miles away from our downtown mm -hmm. and our tallest building uh, or one of the taller buildings is called Tower City. And I happened to look down, it was a clear day, and Tower City was standing straight up. Uh -huh. And I had been watching Michael with the experiments and sort of saying, hmm, okay, that's fine. But then when I saw that Tower City was still standing straight up and I knew we were 13 miles away and I was looking at it and I said, hey, Michael, the earth is flat. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, uh, yeah, I've been telling you that for a while. Um, and then after that, you know, the word says that Yah will give us signs and wonders by his yes. his own earth or right. you know, his own yeah. world. And then I that's when my eyes sort of start opening to things is I just start observing what was around me. And, right. and it just seems so evident once you know. Yes. It it's just falls in falls in place. Yes, yes. Uh yeah, likewise myself, um, uh, when reconsidering and examining this particular topic with open mind because I was extremely hesitant to do so initially and it took a lot of uh, persuasion from my friends and listening audience uh, to you know basically prove myself a hypocrite or actually examine it um, with open perspective and once I did so I learned very quickly that there's no curvature to the earth and also that the dynamics of water is that it can in no way uh, it, without any doubt not adhere to a ball it would just drip off or if the earth is spinning it would spin off in streams and so you know the fact that they say that uh, the magical power of gravity uh, holds all these millions of gallons of water to the earth is again Impossible. it's just yeah, it's absolutely impossible, especially yeah. when you consider that, you know, uh, birds and bugs and things of that nature are able to fly against and be released right. from this magical gravity. But um, so you can tell us a little bit about your journey to awakening just on Flat Earth. When you began to look into it, you said it was Mark Sargent's uh, videos that kind of um, piqued your interest. and. Um, can you speak more about that that journey to awakening? I was taking I was taking a break one day from from work, and I was doing some animating and working on a job. And so, I wanted to look at some videos and some some YouTube videos. And I don't. I was just looking for I I, I like to see what other people are doing in the field. You know, mm -hmm. other animators, especially short films. Um, and so I was looking at a short film to watch, you know, I was just going to take a 15 minute break. And then this thing kept coming up, flat earth. I said, flat earth. Oh, that's stupid. You know? So I just kept going. Uh -huh. 
Uh But it kept coming up, you know, which I find interesting because I wasn't looking for anything like that. I was looking for short films. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, that was definitely the Lord. All right. Yes. And so I said, all right, it'd be good for a laugh. Okay. And so (laughs) and so it was called these flat earth uh, clues. And I like to listen to things in order. So I noticed, oh, there's, there's 11 of them. Okay. So so I looked at one and two and three. By the time I got to 11, I sat back and I literally said, oh, my God, the earth is flat. It's flat. You know, I believed it immediately Uh because, again, I'd already been conditioned with with the other truths of 9-11 and all the other stuff, transgenderism and all the other foolishness. And and so I was already set. And so after that, then I read Genesis 1. I said, why did I never read that? And of course, I got angry at myself mm-hmm. because I, I, I call myself a literal Bible reader. OK, I read scripture literally. Yeah, right. Obviously not. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, so. So then again, my whole paradigm had been totally messed up because I believe in space and I used to incorporate space in my art. Now I don't do that, but I used to incorporate space in my art. And uh, all the time uh, making planets and nebulas and stuff like that. Um, And I did not believe. I believe that that people. um, uh, Well, at that point, I didn't believe in the moon landing. I didn't believe in that anymore. But I did believe in space. Okay, and I believe at some point. Well, actually, I didn't believe at that point that man was actually going to end up in space because not because space didn't exist. But because I thought man was so screwed up, they would never get there because they would kill themselves first. Mm -hmm. Um, But once this truth came along, it just pulled everything together and it really opened up scripture. Okay, because once you realize the truth of cosmology, it opens up scripture big time. A lot of people don't understand that. They think it's just um, it's just this little wackadoo subject. That's a fringe subjects in quotes. No, it's the first chapter of the Bible. If you get that wrong, then you're going to screw up everything else. Right. All right? You literally taint everything else. Um, you know, when the Bible talks about the, uh, 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 the earth uh, stopped moving for a day and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, yes. in the heliocentric model, that's instant death. Right. Okay. A horrible, horrible death. But on a flat Earth system, that's easy. That's no problem. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Um. So, well, actually, it didn't say the Earth stopped moving. It said the Sun stopped moving. Yes. Exactly. And, and so, and so, when you realize the true cosmology, you realize, well, what do you know? The Bible, the Scripture, is literally correct. The Sun did stop moving. Whereas in churches, they teach you. Well, it didn't really mean the sun. It really meant the earth, but, you know, it looked like the sun. No, no, stop all that, you know, um, jumping around. It means exactly what it says. So once I came to that truth, I started, just like everyone else, looking at video after video after video. And then I I, I said, you know what? I have this equipment. You know, I'm going to do the experiments myself. And I started doing curvature experiments. And then I uh, stumbled on the corpuscular rays and then the moon. And then I noticed that if you focus on a star, if you focus on one star and then you move your camera over to another star, that star is in focus. Now, in the photographic world, that means that star is on the same plane of focus as the other star, which means they can't be trillions of miles away. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's absolutely. not possible. Yeah, I fully agree. And, um, you know, again, the whole thing of that you can see light at 93 mile, million miles distance no. is absolutely no. ludicrous. No. And no. then the, the story you had made mention of Joshua's long day, yeah. how Joshua was given authority to stop the sun and the moon, not the earth and the moon. Right, right. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it, and it says exactly what it means. This whole doctrine of accommodation where right. where the Lord's like, well, I'm not going to correct them because they're so stupid. They wouldn't understand it anyway. So I'll just let them believe the little the little white lie 
and all that matters is that they know that I love them. Okay, no, come <laughs> on, you know, no, that that did not happen. Um, um, the Lord does not ratify lies at all. He he does not have any lie in him at all. That's I mean that's literally what Scripture says. Right. Okay? He does not lie. So therefore, the uh, the doctrine of accommodation is wrong. Okay. He didn't just yeah. allow them to believe the earth was flat because they were just primitive and stupid. No, it's simply not true. Right. And there's and now here's the beautiful part about it. There's literally no proof to support the helocentric model. None right. at all. Absolutely. Okay? What they have is a construct. What yeah. they have built, they've built a construct, a little reality and rules that support that reality. It's called story craft in the movie world. When right. you build a narrative and you build rules around that narrative to, to make that narrative believable. That's why movies like Star Wars, Star Trek, and stuff like that are very successful because they're believable. Yes, no, there's no Federation and, and, and we know the Empire doesn't exist. But when you watch the movie, it's believable because they set up a set of rules. Scientism is exactly the same way, okay? Yes. But if you look at those rules and you take them apart, you find that they are riddled with contradictions, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, most certainly. Um, in some of the, the older books from the 18th century, the 19th century, that talk about this, they call it priestcraft. They should know that one word of God is all and all are one. If the Bible is false in one, it is false in all. If the Copernican system is correct, then Genesis is a myth. Is scripture, which has enlightened the world for thousands of years, now to be eclipsed by a science which has erred so often and is altogether fallacious in so many things? Much indeed is at stake. Satan is bold. Let us be true philosophers and not blindly follow the teachings of either old or modern astronomers and their many wild assumptions. But let us ever follow the truth. If the above reasons enable even a single soul to throw off the shackles of mere superstitious reverence for the Copernican dogma, and of blind subservience to a scientific priestcraft which abuses its authority most shamefully, the consequence for good may be incalculable. F. E. Pache, uh, 50 Reasons Copernicus or the Bible, which you can find at our website, sacredwordpublishing.com. And so uh, I think he says it uh, extremely well. And as we were talking about with the um, you know, science so falsely, um, you know, as far as being a false religion, a false faith, um, certainly it is a priestcraft, in my opinion. It, it definitely point. is. I, I love that that uh, term, priestcraft. And at, at the end of the day, um, the cosmos, the great universe, the the solar system was actually created by Satan. It was not created by the Most High. Um, it is a well-constructed, very old lie created by um, the father of lies himself. Yeah, certainly the heliocentric. And I think that the reason that this whole narrative has been pushed and has been created, in my opinion, is to bring forth the strong delusion and the reign of the Antichrist, which... I believe is connected to the myth that is being perpetuated now that the ancient aliens created us and that, you know, the <laughs> extraterrestrials are our gods, which is again, another false construct based upon the Darwinian Copernican heliocentric model for understanding world. Now, you know, the beautiful part about the enclosed cos cosmology truth is that when that great deception or the great disclosure comes and our alien brothers or alien enemies, whichever form it takes, when that happens, 
anyone who realizes the earth is flat will say, oh, that's a lie. Right. No, that's not happening. Right. They'll look up and see this giant Independence Day uh, spaceship floating up in the sky. And we who know the truth will say, nice effects, dude. I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Yeah. But we'll know flat out that that is a lie. Okay. Right. Just, we, heck, we won't even have to pray about it. We'll just know. Okay. Because knowledge is supposed to increase in the last days, but a lot of churches don't realize that knowledge goes both ways, okay? It's not just talking about Satan, it's talking about those that worship the Most High as well. He's going to give us more knowledge about himself, and that's what this movement is about. And yes, I definitely call it a movement, because if you looked at it four years ago, before four years ago, you punched up Flat Earth on YouTube, you got 50 hits, mm -hmm. Okay. In less than a year, you got, what was it, 20, 23 million? Okay, come on. That's a movement. Right, okay? yeah. All right? So, so this, this great truth is, is a, it, 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 it's going to help us keep our eyes open when this delusion really hits hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I fully agree. And I, again, I think that, you know, even the mark of the beast, uh, the beast system, the new world order, mm -hmm. uh, the Antichrist taking over that beast system, that all these things are connected to uh, the coming reign of the Antichrist as this uh, extraterrestrial being. Uh, have you ever heard of that um, sci-fi miniseries called Childhood's End? I've heard of it. I've never seen it, but I've heard it. Is that a Netflix thing? Um I'm not sure if you can find it on Netflix or not, um, okay. but yeah, if you look up the childhoods in that particular story, it's about, um, you know, basically these, the overlords, which they hide themselves for the first 50 years that they make themselves present uh, and um, aware to the, to humanity. And when they come, you know, they do all these miracles, they end the wars, they end suffering. Oh, wait a minute. Is this the series where, where the overlords look like Satan? Exactly. Ah, yes. that one. Yes, I've seen yeah. that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, in my opinion, that is exactly the setup for what we are contending with. You know, because now we have the ancient aliens, uh, the History Channel. That show is number one in the world. That's and disgusting. yeah, and they are declaring at every turn of the way that, you know, that the angels were extraterrestrials and that it's not, um, you know, that the Bible is all a story about the extraterrestrials seeding humanity so long ago. And so they've turned <laughs> everything upside down uh, and mm -hmm. they've given, you know, the uh, as far as the uh, God um, being the creator um, and Yeshua, the Savior, Messiah, the Son, um, the only begotten and the Holy Spirit being part of that, that pre-existing Godhead, they've turned all that around and attributed and given credit to the extraterrestrials uh, for supposedly creating humanity long ago. And so, uh, in my opinion, this is one of the main reasons I believe that this knowledge is coming to light because as you said when you know the truth of the enclosed world system and biblical cosmology it totally negates the whole uh, belief in an ever expanding universe and that every star in the night sky is a sun with possible planetary system uh, in revolution and orbit around it and that they could have evolved life millions of years ahead of our system. I mean, all of these things become impossible when you know that, uh, you know, we are living in an enclosed system and that the Most High God is seated right there uh, above the North Pole at the uh, the center yeah. of the Baltic Dome. Yep, 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 yeah. right there by, by Polaris. I mean, right. that, okay, my thing is this. Science confuses us with all their numbers and all their vastness because they use the vastness of space, all these huge numbers to confuse us. Right. Okay. My 
my point is this. Keep it down to the bare bone basics. Prove space exists. If you can prove space exists, everything we're talking about is another boy. Right, right. Okay, but they can't. They cannot prove because without space, you got nothing. All right. right. You have no whole um, solar system. You, you, you have no great cosmos. All of that is gone. And if you look at scientism, they have they basically have a, a, a triune God. OK, mm -hmm. they have space. Space is actually a God. OK, mm -hmm. and think about it. Space is bigger than Yahweh. Right. Because space is ever expanding. Right. And infinite. Yeah, it's infinite, both, yeah. You know, so so space is bigger than God. So you have space and you have the sun um, with the 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 sun, the, the big hydrogen ball that they call our sun. Right. And you have gravity. When uh -huh. you put that trilogy together, okay, that's their triune God of the heliocentric uh -huh. model. Because with those three things, you have evolution, you have the great cosmos, you have the whole binding power that puts all of this together. In fact, the very power that created everything, gravity. Right? Right, right. So if you look at that, that's the triune God of heliocentrism. Mm -hmm. But if you disprove that, or they have to prove it, okay? But if you cease believing in that and see the, the uh, truth in, if you see the, the truth that totally disproves those lies, then the rest of it literally falls apart. It's like a house of cards with no foundation. It just collapses. Without yeah. space, you got nothing. Right. Yeah, and you know, we realize that when you realize that there's no curvature, no matter what you think about the shape of the earth, right, it, right. there's no rotundity to it. It cannot nope. be a sphere or a globe. And when you realize that scripture declares that the earth is fixed, stationary, and unmoving, then mm -hmm. you know, you got you have to reconsider everything we've been taught with regard to the whole paradigm of heliocentricity either the bible is true or it's not either scripture is exactly true or it's not. yes right. okay either it's a lie or it's true you can't have both you cannot blend heliocentrism and scripture um neil degrasse tyson actually said that um uh, what was that quote he said that they are unreconcilable you cannot reconcile scripture and science mm -hmm, and, right. the, uh, and he was specifically talking about heliocentrism you cannot reconcile them he's right okay one of the few times neil degrasse tyson is right <laughs> okay uh and when i heard that i said wow that's totally true you can't mm -hmm. all right so you have to choose one or the other we know christian friends that that i mean we just heard a couple of sermons where where they talk about this this beautiful flowing Flowery sermon that talks about how the uh, uh, the God of Scripture created the entire cosmos and nebulas and the endless cosmos <laughs> right. in order to show him. Yet, yet, now here's the funny part: when they talk, when they say those those uh, sermons, when they preach those sermons, they do not spout Scripture. They do not point to Scripture to support right. it. They actually right. point to science. Okay. Right. But you can't do that. You have to support it with scripture, but they can't. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about an ever expanding infinite cosmos. Nowhere. Right. It's not there. Okay. Now, now wait a minute. You mean to tell me something that big is not discussed one time in the entire scripture? Not one time. Come right. on. That's not possible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In fact, you know, me and uh, Rob, we've been doing this series where we're going through the Genesis timeline uh, and we've gone through the first five days of creation and already have done 10 hours of broadcast <laughs> on this information. I uh, out. Yeah, but you know, it, the luminaries, the sun, the moon, the stars, mm -hmm. they don't even come into being till the fourth day <laughs> and then they're placed into the firmament, you know? Right. Right. Um, and so, I mean, the whole thing of planetary accretion and the model for how the the sun, uh, the all the stars being suns that they uh, had in orbit around them, these dust balls that then 
gained mass and became these planets. Uh, you know, <laughs> all of that is absolutely contrary to scripture. It is. Um, you, you, you can't have both. You have right. to choose between one because um, usually pastors say, well, scripture is, is, is actually a metaphor. So, so when it talks in Genesis, when it talks about the flat earth, it's actually a metaphor for a globe. Okay, wait, 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 back up, back up. You <laughs> right. can't, that's completely opposite. So when I say I, I'm, I'm as hungry as an ox, that doesn't mean I have no appetite whatsoever. Okay. Uh -huh. it, it means I'm ready to really throw down and eat a lot. Okay? Yeah. That's what it means. It illustrates a concept. So a metaphor does not mean the opposite. Right. of what of, of of the picture is trying to illustrate right so 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 scripture couldn't be a whole bunch of metaphor yes there are metaphors in there like for instance ephesians 6 we just illustrated ephesians 6 you gotta see that it turned out really well we we yeah, I'll just, check it out. uh um ephesians 6 um uh the armor of god yeah. okay yes it's a metaphor but it's talking about the spiritual armor we're supposed to wear to protect us from from the attacks of Satan, but yes, it is a metaphor. It doesn't mean we're supposed to buy army and wear it all the time. Okay, that's not what it means. But when the Bible talks about a metaphor, it is very clear when it is a metaphor. It is very clear. You don't have to guess about it or do a whole bunch of research. It tells right. you right there. Okay. Right. So when it's talking about creation, it does not talk in metaphorical terms. Right. It talks in literal terms. Exactly. Unless it discuss, you know, this is a parable. <laughs> it will Which tell it, you that. It will tell you exactly. This, this is right. like this, or, right. or something like. It will talk in metaphorical terms. Right. Okay. Right. But see, we're not taught this in church. You yeah. have to study to show yourself approved. You have Absolutely. to study for yourself and let the Holy Spirit guide you. I'm not saying church is irrelevant, but what I'm saying is, when you hear that sermon, you have to go and study it for yourself. Because right. if you don't, you're in trouble. Right. And as your wife declared earlier in the program, uh, don't trust pastors, preachers, ministers to interpret the word for you. No. Go and read it for yourselves. Because, no. uh, you know, as it says in Proverbs, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to seek it out. And so, yes, we must study to show ourselves approved, to read the scripture for ourselves. Uh, we've got just about nine minutes remaining, so okay. I want to give both of you, uh, Maria and Michael, a chance for final commentary. Uh, but before you do so, if you would, share your website and your contact and all of your information, again, where people can go to find and listen to your, uh, your broadcast and when it is that you go live or, or we'll be continuing to uh, stream okay. you know, your live okay. shows. We're going to stream our live shows on NIUC TV. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, take because we were on NIUC TV, uh -huh. um, but but we're on Take on the World TV, and we will be streaming uh, Canon Quest um, on 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 that network. And we actually have some shows there now, but we're going to start that up again. Um, and uh, you can actually go see Canon Quest in its entirety uh, at CanonQuest.com. And I actually have the phone number now because I didn't have it memorized. It's 216-273-0015. And we will actually answer the phone. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we also have the Facebook page, Canon Quest. And we have the YouTube channel, Canon Quest. Excellent. Uh, Maria, would you care to share a final thought with the listening audience? Uh, anything uh, at all? Um, well, I just wanted to also remind people that we are on Sacred Word Publishing, yes. um, and, and we're really proud about that, and thank you so much for your Joy support. did a wonderful job, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah she does incredible work. I'm uh, so blessed to have her on board with this ministry, and yes, it's a great honor for us to also host your work as well. Um. Maria, do you have things? Okay. So, um, oh, one other thing. Um, we're going to animate every single car. Okay. Very cool. Um, that is our, our primary goal. And when I say animate, I'm talking cinematic, Cecil B. DeMille, you know, full 
score because we actually uh, uh, just landed a deal with with a uh, film scorist that does actually film scores. He's actually worked for us in our commercial work, and he's going to do a cinematic score per card. All right, um, but um, our goal is to animate every single card. And uh, we're going to do a five-minute animation per card. So we're going to start at like a couple of minutes before the event that's depicted and a couple of minutes after the the uh, event that's depicted in a specific card. Uh, and that can be used for study, sermons, um, uh, uh, vacation Bible school, you name it. So that is a primary thing that, that we're trying to get together now. Very cool. So how big is the first set um each set uh has six trading cards and six activity books okay so when you buy a set it it it, it has all of that and uh there's an activity book per card so when you open up the activity book it actually has a synopsis of of the event it has the name of of, of the uh, person in hebrew um and their Date of, and, and their uh, place of birth, their family, that sort of thing. Also, it has a coloring page, mazes, and Maria does the interior of, of the uh, activity books. Um, so when you see all the puzzles, she actually creates those puzzles by hand. I mean, they're, they're all original. So she doesn't find them online and just flop them in the book. And that's one thing that we really love doing is everything we do is original. So you have six activity books, and uh, six trading cards. Oh, and the trading cards are slightly larger than your traditional trading card because we wanted to show, really show the art off. Yes, uh, yeah. Well, your art is really beautiful, Thank and uh, I'm sure that the posters would be a great wall adornment for anybody that uh, chooses to purchase them. You can find all of the information at Canon Quest and also on our website at sacredwordpublishing.com. Um, you know, I greatly appreciate both of you taking the time to join us in broadcast and to share your testimony. Uh, it was a great honor for me to be able to share this time with you. And I thank you for, you know, speaking about all of your work and uh, your awakening to truth. Michael, I'll give you a chance to, for final comment. We've got about four minutes remaining. Okay. Um... So, uh, well, I first of all, I want to thank you. Uh, finally, getting a chance to meet Zen Garcia. So, um, <laughs> so I, I, it was a great honor for us to be on your show, and um, and, and we're very excited to be on Sacred Word uh, Publishing. Um, I just want to tell everyone: uh, don't accept verify. Do your yes. own research. You do not have to be a scientist. You do not have to have a lab coat and and a pocket protector in order to be capable of, of, of discerning this great world that, that, that the Lord built for us. So do your own research and the, and the truth, the Holy Spirit will just blast you with the truth and he will open up scripture for, for you. So uh, don't just accept what you hear. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, everybody uh, thinks that this knowledge is just um, you know, lunacy and ridiculous to go into, but yet it's the easiest thing to confirm as truth. All one has to do is look for, try to detect curvature, and you could do a laser point test like uh, the Bedford level experiment. Very mm -hmm. easy to realize that curvature is non existent, and also the dynamics of water. It yeah. always gathers always. together, collects in pool. At a level, you know, and, and, and also people need to realize everyone, you need to realize that this is a relational issue. When yeah. you learn the truth of our world, you you get closer to the creator. OK, think yeah. about that. You learn the truth of how he created the world and why that means you become closer. And once you realize that he's right on the outside of the dome, that yeah. blew my mind. OK, right. when I learned that he wasn't in some other dimension somewhere, you know, so so right. that's that part, I think, is really important for for people to realize. I agree with you, because, you know, a lot of people also in an ever expanding universe, 
with all these millions of worlds. <laughs> you know, even though God is omnipotent and I'm sure he could handle contending with all that, sure. but yet we are the apple of his eye. We mm -hmm. are the only game in town. He is fully narrowly focused on the prophetic, bringing the prophetic end uh, as he's related in scripture and revealed it through his prophets that he is going to fulfill all that he has said mm -hmm. in his word uh, and the end days and the end times, uh, the second coming of Christ uh, as Savior Messiah, that salvation is through him. All these are critical themes to understand, and it's all contained within the inspired word. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, brother, we've got uh, just one more minute remaining. So uh, final thought, quick commentary. Final thought is I'm, I'm, my life has changed. Maria's life has changed. Um, once we realize this great truth, in addition to all the other truths yeah. and, and this, this it's almost like starting the journey all over again, or at the very least um, 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 embarking on another part of it that has really changed everything for us. And, and the part that we love so much is sharing it with the other, yes. uh, those other believers that have realized all these great truths. Right. Yeah. Like even, you know, our coming together in collaboration in this manner and uh, our being able to gather in Dallas with it really what seems to be a family, you know, of Indeed. Uh, truth Indeed. seekers and mm -hmm. everybody coming to truth in a different manner. But um, yeah, it's going to be a blessing. And, uh, Look forward to meeting both of you in person and in Dallas in November. And, uh, you know, again, we appreciate you coming on to the show and uh, sharing with us and uh, canonquest.com again, everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. Be blessed all until next week. And next, uh, next Thursday, Rob will be joining me for the sixth day of the creation week. And, uh, it's been an amazing series so far. Be blessed all. Good night.